Our God is a God who saves. When we're drowning in our fears, anxieties, our tears, he rescues us, lifts us up from the waves, beauty for ashes in a beautiful exchange. This is our God who loves us faithfully, freely. His love transforms and changes, brings us hope and healing. A God who loves more than words could ever say. He knows our deepest thoughts yet loves us anyway. Our God is strong, victorious. He's the creator of the universe. He is glorious. Our friend, comforter, companion and guide crying out to you now, his arms open wide. This is our God. Morning, morning. Wonderful to be with you all. Welcome to those of you joining in the room. Welcome to those online. Um, welcome to Leicester campus and also welcome to my family in Cambridge. Great to be with you. I am loving this series. This is our God as we look at who God is as revealed in the book of Isaiah. And when I was asked to speak on this today, it was an easy yes for me. It was an easy choice. I love the book of Isaiah. I love teaching. I love how we're getting to kind of sit in some chapters and really go deep in them. It was an easy choice. And there are easy choices in life, right? And there are also harder choices. Um, I tend to find it quite easy to decide what I want for dinner um, that night. I know that's not a blessing everyone has, but I tend to open the fridge like, yes. Or if, um, if my husband, John, is cooking, he'll reel off the options. I'll sit there with a blank face and then straight away, as soon as he suggests what I actually want, yeah. the smile comes on. <laughs> but I find it hard to decide what to wear, especially at this time of year. Like when I left... Simon and Dia's house this morning. I think it was like eight degrees or something like that. And it's going to be 20, I think, when we leave. How do you dress for that? <laughs> also, when you're in Cambridge, you've got to factor in cycling and wear something you can wear cycling and potentially get drenched in. <laughs> Harder choice. But then there are also like bigger life choices that, even though they're higher stakes, can be easy. I remember going with my husband to view a house and we knew within five minutes that that was supposed to be our house. That was an easy choice, even though it was a massive decision. But then once we moved in, maybe you resonate with this, it took us three weeks to decide what colour to paint the hallway. Like what shade of, we knew white, but what shade of white took us three weeks. It was a harder choice. And these choices that are easy, it's usually because one of the options has everything going for it, and one has absolutely nothing going for it. And I've got a couple of options for you here today. Um, I want you to imagine that I'm offering you some bread for a sandwich for lunch, and decide which of these you're going to choose. So I've got my first offering is I've got a, um, a stone-baked sourdough fresh loaf. Looks quite nice. That's your option one. And then option two... Um, is mouldy bread. Now, I was going to have one mouldy bread to offer you, um, and I, I left some bread out on the side for the week to see how mouldy it would get for Sunday. Um, but then the preaching team, who are so wonderfully helpful with um, prepping preachers together, decided they would also bring their offering. So um, you've got option number two. Is This is, this is my offering. Um, nice bit of something growing on there. This is Chris and Annabelle's offering, Shaman's offering. Um, all right, I think... I Oh, great, yeah, that's a good angle as well. Um, but then, yesterday, Dave and Karen discovered something living in their bread <laughs> bin at home. No idea of how long it's been there. Um, so this is, I, this is Dave and Karen's. I actually don't think it's, it's bread anymore. I think it's broken down. Um, and it re actually really smells. So I'm going to, um, actually, I'm not going to be able to preach with this on this table, so I'm going to seal it off and leave it over here. Um, Anyway, back to the preach. Um, which choice are you making? Do you want the nice, fresh bread, option number one? Option number two, mine, t uh, three, Chris and Annabelle's, or four, Dave and Karen's? I think we're going to go for option number one, aren't we? An easy, easy choice. In Isaiah chapters 43 and 44, Isaiah presents us with two choices. And really, they should be easy choices for us to make. Uh, it's quite clear, he's making it quite clear to us which we should choose. He chose us, shows us how awesome our God is, how he is Lord with all power and strength and that he is also gentle and kind and beckons us to him and carries our burdens. This gentle Lord calls us into a relationship with him and we should choose him in a heartbeat. 
over all the alternatives. But we don't always make the right choice. The Israelites certainly didn't. Plus, we can end up making the right choice at one point and then drifting from that unintentionally over time. My hope for us today is that as we look at these chapters, as we catch a fresh glimpse of who our God is, we would make the right choice. We would say, wow, God is better than I could ever imagine. Why would I turn to anything else? As we get this revelation of who he is, the choice, it becomes easy. It becomes the choice between artisan bread or moldy bread. So let's look at these two choices that Isaiah gives us. Um, and what they reveal about who our God is. So choice number one, choose your God, the Lord or idols. These chapters of Isaiah are uh, directed towards the Israelites who were in exile in Babylon. They were surrounded by countless options of other gods out there. And Isaiah wants to make it very clear that the Lord is so far superior to these gods and that all the other options are mouldy bread in comparison. So Isaiah first starts off by reminding the Israelites of who their God is. The main name used for God in Isaiah and used more than 6,500 times in the whole Bible is the name, the Lord. Isaiah 44 verse six says, this is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. God is the Lord Almighty. And when you see Lord written in your Bible with those four letters in capital letters, that's a translation of the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, which God gave to Moses and it means I am or I will be. It means he's not dependent on anyone else. He's so far above everyone else. He has nothing else to kind of compare himself to. The Lord, and he's not just the Lord, he's the Lord Almighty. He has all might. It's almost like every other characteristic that we read in this, these two chapters flows from this. He exists for all eternity and is outside of time. I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. He is the creator of all things, including you. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. Also, he has dealt with your past mistakes. I have swept away your offences like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. And then he knows and is in control of the future, even when it doesn't make sense to us. At the end of uh, chapter 44, Isaiah names and says that there's gonna be a king and he, he says his name is Cyrus and he is gonna be the one to lead my people out of exile or to release my people from exile. And Isaiah is making this prophecy 150 years before the event. And it's almost like God is saying, not only do I know every single detail of history, past, present, and future, but I'm also in control and will use past, present, and future to bring glory to myself and for the good of my people. That is our Lord today. Yeah, come on. So Israel's God is the Lord, the rock and the creator who holds all things in his hand with all knowledge and all power. This is the God that we get to know today. Isn't that amazing? And we're making decisions knowing that God is Lord and knows my future and has a plan for my life, takes the pressure off me, it releases me from being the one in control and striving to make stuff happen. When I was finishing uni and I didn't know what my next step was gonna be, I just felt God tell me, it's okay, you don't need to have the master plan, just take the next step. And he told me when I needed to know, he told me what my next step was. And then once I'd taken that, he told me when I needed to know. Um, it would be nice if he told us all the whole plan at the start, but knowing that God is Lord and is tr a trustworthy person to entrust my future to changes how we make decisions. And as I sit at the moment with a big unanswered prayers in my life, knowing that God is Lord just, it's just good. It's just the only way I could get through. You know, knowing that he is in control of the future, that I can trust him to work everything out. And particularly as with prayers, it's good to know what's our role and what's God's role. That I can pray and I can ask him and I can wait on him, but I can let him do the job of being the Lord. I take so much comfort in knowing that he is Lord. He is Lord over all. This is our God, Lord of all creation and Lord of all time. And Isaiah then describes where, uh, the idols in a way to show how powerless they are in comparison to the Lord. A man cut down cedars or perhaps took a, a cypress or oak. 
He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It is used as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. He also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Look how different idols are to the Lord. The Lord who is the first and last has existed for all eternity. And then on the other hand, we have this idol, which is, uh, I've actually cut, like there's there's almost half a chapter that describes how long it takes to make an idol. And there's this whole process where the like rain has to come and the tree grows and the the carpenter cuts it down and carves into it. He has to stop to take a break for his dinner and then he gets back to it. He's got the priorities right. Um, He gets back to cutting down the tree and carving it into an idol. Like it's just such a long process. And yet they're choosing that over the God who already existed. Then we've got the God who can do all things and who knows all things versus this lump of wood. Why would we choose wood that we've formed over the rock that formed us? And that's the point that Isaiah is making. Why would we turn from the awesome Lord to anything else? The other options are just so much worse. And today we might not make wooden idols. I've never made a wooden idol. Um, Anyone want to confess to making a wooden idol? No, okay. Um, But we have modern forms of idols, don't we? We might not have idols that look the same as the Old Testament, but we have new ways of forming idols. Tim Keller, who is um, a pastor in America, he defined an idol as anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. We create an idol every time we look to money, position, fame, achievements or other people to give us what only God can give. To give us satisfaction, comfort, purpose. All of this should come from the Lord. And with this understanding, I can look at my life and see that I've made various idols. As a teenager, I got my self-worth from what others thought about me. As a student, I struggled with looking to um, academic success to be what defined me. And then I I remember sitting in a a service in Kingsgate, Cambridge, where God challenged me that I'd been looking, I didn't have any money, I was a student, um, did not have any money. So I was like, oh, it's fine, I can't make money as an idol. But God challenged me that actually I'd been making the prospect of earning a high paying salary after university into an idol. And, um, and in that moment, um, God invited me to, rather than straight out of uni to look into, I was thinking about being a lawyer or something like that at the time that would get you a nice big salary. Um, God challenged me to give my first year out of uni to him um, without a salary on the Kingsgate internship. And that dealt with that idol. <laughs> if we realise just how worthy our God is of everything... And just how pathetic the idols are in comparison. Like they're like this mouldy bread. We would give our everything to him. We would do whatever it takes to cut out idols, going on the Kingsgate internship, you know, dealing with it in prayer, prayer, season of prayer and fasting, where all you pray about for three days is God, get this out. We would do whatever it takes to get those idols out and to put Jesus back on the throne of our hearts. Has your life, has your mind, has your whole being come completely under the lordship of our lords today, of Yahweh? At the end of the message, we're gonna have a chance to respond to this and to surrender to God afresh. To say, you alone, Lord, are worthy of first place in my life. I'm sorry for where anything has been allowed to compete with you. And maybe you've never made a decision to invite Jesus into your life, to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, you are the only one I want to be in control of my life. Well, that's, and we're gonna have an opportunity to pray with you as well at the end. This is the Lord. He is the Lord of all creation, the first and the last, able to do all things. Like we'll never even be able to get our head around that truth. And yet in the same passage, Isaiah hits us with another thing, which is so astounding that the Lord, the one over all creation is also the gentle Lord. He is gentle. And so once we've chosen our God, our second choice we have to make today is to choose your way, gentle or burden. This weekend, we had our our leaders retreat and we looked at Jesus's invitation in Matthew 11. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, come away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. 
Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay any, anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus could well have had this bit of Isaiah in mind when he was teaching on this because Isaiah addresses the same thing and addresses Israel and says, look, it's not just enough to choose the Lord as your God, but we also have to choose the right way of following him. The method is also important because Israel are not following God in the way they're supposed to, but they're following God in a way that is a burden. Listen to this. Yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense, but you have burdened me with your sins and you have wearied me with your iniquities. Do we spot the theme? God was weary of the Israelites and the Israelites were weary because of the way they'd been worshipping God. They'd gone wrong by choosing burdensome religion over refreshing relationship. They had gone down the route of seeing their relationship with God as kind of a transaction or a contract where they brought sacrifices to God and so he had to do X, Y, and Z for them. They saw offerings as a way to get things from God. And plus they weren't even that good at following the law that they decided they were gonna use to contract God. They're burdened by the weight of having to bring sacrifices to tick the boxes and trying to live out in their own strength. And this is a tendency we all have as humans. We're designed to, to work hard and to exercise a certain level of control. But this has been warped by the fall into us striving to be good enough on our own and trying to exert control over everything. At various points in my life, I've slipped into this trying to be good enough and I've chosen the weary way of following God. If I just read my Bible enough, if I just serve in church, uh, lots at church, if I do enough good things, maybe I'll get an A star from God. But it's always so tiring because I might head out of church on Sunday with the best intentions and then Monday rolls around. You're surrounded by people that are not making those choices. And so begins the cycle of messing up, feeling guilty, and so messing up again. It's a burdensome way to live. If you've ever been in that position, maybe you are now. It is a heavy, burdensome way to live. And God wants you to know through this chapters of Isaiah that that is not his best for you. That is not the way he calls you to live. The alternative, the artisan bread that God offers is this. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. This is not a detached God examining us to see if we make the grade. Instead, this language is of a gentle God. And gentleness isn't about being weak or passive. It's about strength under control. I've heard people use the analogy of a horse to represent gentleness. It's might restrained. And this is what we see in this passage. We see a gentle God in the way that he beckons us to him. He has all power and authority and yet he chooses to give us the free will and for us to to, to make the decision, are we gonna come to him? And he beckons us with these gentle, kind words. I have chosen you, I formed you, I will help you. He uses his gentleness to draw us to him. And then when we come to him, he continues to be gentle in the way that he doesn't give us all the Israelites what we deserve, but offers forgiveness. In this passage, after spending 40 odd chapters telling the Israelites just how messed up they've been, he uses the name Jeshurun. I don't know if you caught it, but it means the upright one. It doesn't sound like they've been very upright, but God has made a way for all their sins, all their mistakes, everything to be gone. And he himself, the gentle Lord, came and took the punishment on the cross. He restrains his right to punish. He took the burden of our mistakes on himself. That is how gentle our God is. And as we go through life with a relationship with this gentle God, it is not a burden, but it is a joy. He promises to pour out water. That water represents the Holy Spirit on the thirsty land of our lives. And the Holy Spirit is so refreshing because he is the one that not just shows us how to live, but empowers us to live that way. I remember receiving real breakthrough in this area and uh, had such a shift in my knowledge, like understanding of who God was. I was reading a book um, that talked about how God doesn't just give us a list of things to do and then let us get on with it while he goes far off and hangs out in heaven. 
No, the gentle Lord actually comes to live on the inside of us. And he's with us all the time. He counsels us. And he he shows us how to live a way to honour him. But also, he gives us the desire to live that way. And this book was specifically talking about prayer. Anyone here struggle to ever want to pray? Like, I don't always jump out of bed, go, yes, I'm ready to pray. I want to do an hour with Jesus. Like, that is not always my first thought, confession. But the Holy Spirit is the one who actually, not rather than just like, Martha, why aren't you praying? Martha, why aren't you praying more? He's the one, no, I want to give you the desire to pray. He actually, living on the inside of us, stirs our hearts and aligns our hearts with God's heart and says, Martha, let's pray. And so I um, read this book and it was really practical. And so now I start my prayer times if I'm ever struggling with the desire to pray. I say, God, I'm really struggling to want to be here. I'm really struggling with the desire. I'm sorry that my desire is not matching up with your desire, but will you help me? Will you come Holy Spirit and help me focus as well? Like like dial down the distractions. And I notice such a difference when I do that, when I start my prayer times with asking the Holy Spirit to guide my heart, to shepherd my desires. It's made my prayer times refreshing rather than this uphill battle of willpower. Doing life led and empowered by the Holy Spirit, it leads to this refreshing relationship. Where do you need refreshing today? Where feels like hard work that you need the Spirit empowering in you today? We have a choice to make about how we want to follow God. Do we want to be burdened by all the things we need to do to try and be good enough and yet always failing? Or do we want to enter into a relationship with the gentle Lord who invites us to know Him, who invites us to walk with Him, who wants to supply our every need and forgive us when we mess up? I know which one I'm choosing. I'm choosing the gentle Lord. What's your choice today? My response to these chapters as I read them through and and I'd encourage you to to go home and check out the chapters for yourself, sit there for a while. We'll also be looking at them. Um, Yeah, go home and have a look at the chapters. And as we do, the choice becomes obvious. That's the point Isaiah's trying to make. Why would we choose anything else? Why would we pick the mouldy bread over the artisan loaf? If we really knew how life-giving relationship with him is, we would throw ourselves upon him without hesitation. This is our God, gentle and Lord. There is nothing that comes close to him or compares. Wherever you are, we're gonna respond. So why don't you stand now? I want us to respond by actually making the choices that I've been talking about. Which God do you choose? Which way do you choose? Maybe as I've been speaking, God's been highlighting something which has been competing for first place in your life. Maybe there's an idol that has gradually been increasing in importance in your heart, or you've been looking to something to provide comfort and security. Or maybe you've become aware of a way of following God that looks more like the burdensome Israelite way than the gentle Lord way. Lord, just come and show us right across this room now. Show us where we've been choosing mouldy bread over the feast that you offer. As I was preparing, I felt like maybe some people were um, idolizing, like projecting a certain self-image to others and that that had become really important to you to be seen a certain way by others. And I just feel like God wants to break that today. I felt like someone's really been idolizing their line manager's approval at work and almost feeling like concern of like, yeah, but this is how I'm motivated, Martha. You don't wanna take this away. But I feel like Isaiah wants to say, look, when we turn to God, everything else falls into place. We're no longer working for a place of striving to gain approval, but working from the approval of Jesus. Where do you need to make the choice today? Where have you drifted? I wanna take a moment for us all to say sorry for where we've not chosen God, for where we've not made the choice to turn to Him and then turn to Him as gentle and Lord God. And maybe for you, this is the first time you're making this decision. Maybe this is the first time you've even heard about who this God is. Well, the best decision you could ever make. 
today is to say, Lord, the God that we're hearing about in Isaiah, these things that Martha's been saying, I've got a lot to learn, but I know I need you in my life. I don't wanna do life on my own in this striving way or turn to anything or anyone other than you. And if you wanna make that choice for the first time today, that's amazing, it's the best decision you could ever make. But for the rest of us that maybe have made this choice before, there's drift, isn't there? And there's almost like a daily need to say, God, I'm gonna realign, I'm gonna re-choose today. Choose the Lord and choose His gentle way. So as I pray, why don't you echo this in your heart, maybe fill out anything God's been pointing you towards specifically. Lord God, I'm sorry for where I've not put you first or chosen religion over relationship. Today I make this choice, you are my Lord. I throw myself on the rock. I choose relationship with you. Thank you for the incredible truth that you are Lord over all things with all power and knowledge but also gentle Lord who died in my place and calls me to know you. Holy Spirit, come and refresh me today. Supply everything I need to live for you. Just receive the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. He is so God, he, good. He is so much better than any alternative. This is the Lord. This is our God, gentle and Lord.